Nai Tilapia. Uh, before I go to the, the statistical aspects, the graphical abstract is here, which is very clear and self-explanatory, giving us an idea that the high fat mixed with the antibiotic, which is used for this study, we create more adverse effects for the tilapia fish, effects such as oxidative stress, endoplasmic reticulum stress, apoptosis, intestinal impairment, intestinal permeability, and micro biota dysbiopsia. All these conditions are impaired intestinal, impaired intestinal health, which causes reduced growth and feed efficiency. So in a nutshell, what was done, they used an antibiotic called oxytetracycline, and uh, they used 200 all may night tilapia. Uh, they didn't use female because uh, from the study, uh, they said male has a way of growing faster, or male tilapias, has uh, they grow faster and they also have uniform size so that's why the study restricted themselves to male night tilapia and the fishes were acclimatized in a 500 liter aseptic tank with dechlorinated water for two weeks uh, next the fishes were hand fed uh, using diets greater or equal to 33% protein and greater or equal to 5% uh, lipid. The tilapias were individually embedded with tracking chip so that they can actually track each of the fish using radio frequency identification. Now they had four treatments in this study um, and each treatment has 30 fish per treatment. So the total initial mean weight for each fish was about 8.45 plus or minus uh, 0.5. And two treatments were fed medium fat, which is acronymed MF for this study, at 70 gram per kilogram, and high fat, which is acronymed HF, at 120 gram per kilogram. And the other two treatments were fed high fats, but in addition, 2.0 gram kilogram diet of the antibiotics, and also the medium fats with the antibiotic, that's oxytetracycline, then the high fat with the antibiotic. So why the medium fat is acronym MF? The high fat is acronym HF. The medium fat with the antibiotic is acronym MFO. And the high fat with the antibiotics is acronym HFO. And although these, um, if we look down where I got this summary from, I want to show us something that I, that I also observed. If we scroll down, if you look at number two, that says materials and method, below it, after explaining uh, these things, the different treatments and how many kg were used and all that, they mentioned that these things that I just mentioned were found in table A1. As you can see, I've highlighted it, table A1. And uh, unfortunately for this paper, I was not able to locate table A1. Um, I went to the supplementary uh, through the internet, and I guess probably needed some form of registration or some form of payment. I can't really say, but I had challenges locating the table A1, which would have been very insightful uh, because of these things. Uh, that were mentioned. Now, we move down to the 
2.2 talked about the estimation of growth performance and the feed efficiency. 2.3 talked about the mesenteric fat index, biochemical assays and body composition analysis. And most of these things were more of the methodology, uh, not like the statistical methodology, but the study methodology uh, that we're using in terms of the experimentation. So I'm going to skip them and go to the part that uh, concerns me, which is uh, 2.10, the statistical analysis. Now, the results were presented in means and standard error of means. Now, means, uh, reason being that the, the, the data values are continuous. And because the data values are continuous, then it's proper to analyze them with means and the standard error of the means. Now, the standard error of the means, it's slightly different from the standard deviation. Now, why the standard deviation gives us a clue of the difference between one value and another value in the column representing the different continuous variable, the standard error of means gives us a better perception of the difference between the mean that you are using, because every study you do, you take a sample, because it is rare to see a study where you would use the entire population. Even the study that they are even using, the night tilapia, juvenile fishes, they won't be able to do a study on all the tilapia fishes that is found in the waters or in the seas. So what they've decided to do, they've decided to take a sample of the tilapia fishes. And whatever result they get from the sample of the tilapia fishes, they want it to be representative of every tilapia fish you could ever find. That's what the research is all about. So when you say standard error of mean, which usually has a value, so the standard error of mean gives us an idea of if the researchers were to use all the fishes in the sea or all the tilapia fishes in the sea, this is what the, the standard error of mean would give you an idea of the plus or minus of what the mean would have been. For example, if I have a mean of 2.0, and I have a standard error of mean of 0 0.5. All I'm trying to say or is a standard error of mean of plus or minus 0 0.5. What I'm trying to say is the mean for this particular sample study is 2. But if I had used all these fishes in the sea, my mean would probably have been 2 minus 0 0.5 or 2 plus 0 0.5. So my mean would have been between uh, 1.5 or 2.5 if I had sampled the entire population. So that's the benefit of the standard error of mean. It gives us an idea of what our mean would be if we use the entire population. So the smaller your standard error of mean, the better for your study. Because the smaller the standard error of your mean, it tells us that your study is more accurate because your population mean is not far from your sample mean, right? So uh, apart from that, they also did Shapiro week and Levin's test. Now, reason being that these are continuous data and when you have continuous data and you want to analyze them, you can decide to do parametric form of analysis or non-parametric form of analysis. So for you to be able to make that choice of what form of analysis to do, you need to know if your data is skewed or not, or if your data is normally distributed. So most times the proper thing to do is to do the Shapiro week, you know, the Shapiro week test, that way, or also called Shapiro week normality test. That way you can actually tell if your data is normally distributed. And it has the Shapiro week normality test has what they call the norm. You know, every study has a null hypothesis and, a, and an alternate hypothesis. Now for the Shapiro weak normality test, the null is that the data is normal. That's the null hypothesis. That's the baseline for the Shapiro weak normality test. The data is normally distributed. Now, when you run that test, 
it will give you a value and also give you a p-value. If your p-value is not statistically significant, what do you do? You accept your null hypothesis that your data is normally distributed. Now, your data being normally distributed means you're going to use the parametric form of data analysis, meaning you're going to be using means. You're going to be using student t-test if you're comparing two means. You're going to be using analysis of variance if you're comparing three means and above. Because your Shapiro weak normality test, the p-value is not significant, meaning you will accept the null hypothesis that your data is normally distributed. But in a case where your p-value is statistically significant, you would reject your null hypothesis that your data is normally distributed because your p being statistically significant automatically tells you that your data deviates from normal distribution. So that way you're not going to use a parametric test or parametric method of statistical analysis. You're going to use non-parametric. And in non-parametric, you begin to deal with medians. So why for the parametric, if you're comparing two means, you're going to use student t-test. If you're comparing three means, you're going to use ANOVA. For the non-parametric, if you're comparing two medians, you're going to use the man with me U-test. Then if you're comparing three medians, you're going to use the Kruskawalis. So that is the benefit of doing the Shapiro week. That way it gives you an idea what type of test you're going to use. Now, for the Levin's test, the Levin's test is also important because the Levin's test tests something very interesting, especially when you're using fishes from different environments, all right? Although they bought these fishes from one particular place, but they can't really tell if all the tilapia fishes were captured from the same waters. So it is proper for the researchers to also do the living test. The living test checks for homogeneity, homogeneity of the variance to ensure that the tilapia fishes they are using about 120, they have 30, 30, 30, 30 in four treatment. You're using up to, you're using 120 tilapia fishes. So you want to be sure that they don't vary much from each other. Because if these fishes have high variability, then you would not, you, you, whatever inferences you get may not be uniform because they differ so much. So the researchers, apart from checking for normality of their data, they also want to ensure that the variability in the fishes or in the specimens are not much. So this living test also has a null hypothesis. And what is the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis says variances are equal, meaning that there is no much variance in your sample population. So you run this, if you have a p-value that is not statistically significant, definitely you would accept your null hypothesis that says there is, the, there is no variability in your sample or in your study population. That way you're good in using the parametric form of data analysis. So this is uh, uh, the two uh, tests, the two initial tests that the researchers undertook, which is very proper, all right? Now, secondly, uh, they did statistical comparisons of the, the MF, which I mentioned to you is the medium fat. So in this study, they will be comparing the medium fat and the medium fat with the, with the, with the antibiotics. Then they will be comparing the high fat and the high fat with the antibiotic, which is represented as HFO. And they will be comparing the MF, which is the medium fat and the high fat. And they will be comparing the medium fat with the antibiotic and the high fat with the antibiotic. So because they would be comparing two items at a time, they would probably be using the student t-test. And they are checking for differences in means between these two variables, all right? So uh, let's, uh, let's move ahead. So another thing that uh, they did here, which if you can see, is they did the Pearson's correlational coefficient. Now, the reason is because when you're comparing two, you know, comparisons of two variables, you know, uh, you would, if for, for you, the reason why you, you want to compare two variables is because you want to check whether there is a difference in these two variables that you're comparing. 
Now, if you're going to compare two variables that are categorical, meaning that they are percentages, you're going to use the chi-square, which is the proper test to use. And you would have your p-value at the side of it. If the p-value is less than or equal to 0 0.05, it means that the chi-square is statistically significant. So when you're comparing two proportions or three proportions of percentages, you use the chi-square. Like I've mentioned before, two means the t-test, three means the ANOVA. But in a case where you have two continuous variables, two raw continuous variables, you want to compare them. What do you use is the Pearson's correlational coefficient. This way, you want to see, for example, if the meat fat values, if the meat fat in the variables they are comparing it with is increasing, is the meat fat with the antibiotic increasing or decreasing in that same variable they are comparing it with. So that's why they are using the Pearson's correlation and it has a range between zero and one. 0 0.5 below means a weak correlation. 0 0.5 above could mean between moderately and strong correlation. The positive could mean if the dependent variable is increasing, the independent variable is increasing. Why the negative would mean that if the dependent variable is increasing, the independent is decreasing. So the reason why they are using the Pearson's correlation is because at the time they would be comparing two continuous variable and Pearson's correlation is the best test of significance to do. Now for the results, the 3.1 says high fat diet worsens the adverse effect of oxy tetracycline on growth performance, feed efficiency, and body composition of the fish. So let's go to the figures where these things were shown. If we look at this figure, the figure one, which looks at the growth performance, the feed efficiency, and the body composition of the night tilapia, Let's see what the first chart is showing us. This is a bar graph. So at the side here, you would see weight gain. At the side here, you will see weight gain. Weight gain from 200 to 350. The blue is the meat fat. The red here is the meat fat with the antibiotics. Then you have the HF, which is the high fat. Then you have the HFO, which is the high fat with the antibiotic. This table is showing us that there was a decreased weight gain, as you can see here. The MF is up to 325% weight gain, while the MFO, which is the meat fat with the antibiotic, has a reduced weight gain, all right? So this is showing us that the meat fat with the antibiotic caused a reduction in weight gain in the bar graph in A, like we can see. Now, this little thing here is the standard error of the mean. All right, so it gives you a clue of the standard error of the mean. Now, what the researchers decided to do was to use this diagram with an asterisk up here to tell that they are looking at the, studies, the test of significance between MF and MFO. Since from the A, we are seeing that there is a decreased weight gain in MFO compared to MF. They now want to see using the student T-test to see whether there's a statistic difference in this reduction. If the MFO has a statistically significantly reduced weight gain compared to the MF, the meat fat without the antibiotics. And from what they mentioned here, if you look down here, they said that the asterisk, the asterisk indicates a significant difference. So wherever you see the asterisk, it shows that there is a significant difference. Now, my only challenge is that 
test of significance comes with the test itself. The p-value only gives us a clue whether the test of significance is statistically different or not. For example, in this case now, they checked if the student t-test is different between MFO and MF. And they showed us that the p-value is significant. For me personally, what I always do is I would impute or I would list or show the student t-test, then show the p-value. Because the p-value is actually not the test of significance. The p-value only gives us a clue of what our test of significance is saying. So I always encourage researchers that the proper thing to do when you're doing a test of significance is to show the value of the test of significance before showing us the p-value. The p-value is not the test of significance. It's only an evidence to show that the test of significance is either, is, is either, it's either statistically significant or not. Okay, now they also did something. They also checked if there is a statistic difference between the high fat and the high fat with the antibiotics. As we can see, the high fat without the antibiotic, the weight gain is up to, up to 300, close to 325. But the high fat diet with the antibiotic caused a drastic reduction in the weight gain, which is a little above 225, which is a little above 225, okay? So the T-test from this asterisk here is telling us that there is a statistical significant difference in weight gain between the high fat and the high fat with the antibiotics. Now, what I am not clear you know, this one is clear between the MF and the MFO. That's a student T-test. This one is clear between the HF and the HFO, which is the student T-test. But this one running from the MFO to the HFO is not very clear to me. So if I wouldn't know if they are trying to check if there's a difference between the MFO, the HF, and the HFO. I wouldn't know that. And if you're going to do a comparison between MFO, HF, and HFO, it means you have increased your variable from two to three, meaning that the appropriate test to use in this case would be the analysis of variance. But I can't say if that is what the researchers are trying to achieve. And I don't know if it is proper to check for difference in MFO, HF, and HFO, since the variables are slightly different and they are not measuring the same thing. Now, uh, thirdly, if you look at the weight gain, the weight gain here was represented in percentages. I know that even if the values that were collected are raw values, they are continuous values, but the, the, the weight gain representation here is in percentage. And when you're com if, if we're going to compare percentages, then chi-square would have been the appropriate test to use in this case, and not the student t-test. Now, moving to our B is the same thing. B is looking at the feed intake. And we can see that there's a reduction in feed intake in the MFO compared to the MF, and it's statistically significant. Also, there's a reduction in the feed intake in the HFO compared to the HF. And the asterisk here is giving us a clue that what we are measuring is statistically significant. Now, in the C, in the C, the feed conversion ratio is slightly higher for the MFO 
compared to the MF. But up here, we didn't see we we didn't see the line that gives us a clue uh, whether these two comparisons is statistically significant or not. I guess it is missing uh, for this, uh, but we have it here to show that there is a statistical significant lower feed conversion ratio for HF compared to HFO. The same thing was done for D, which shows a slightly, uh, which shows a significant reduction in MFO in the mesenteric fat index compared to the MF. Protein content and also lipid content. The lipid content is also showing us the same thing, that there's a statistical significant reduction in lipid content in the MFO category compared to the MF. And the asterisk here shows the significant. Now, the figure one is clear, although for me, uh, what I would have done is to, is to show the values or the test of significant values, you know, because that will also uh, help us to know if they use, like in this case now, if you look below here, if you look below here, they gave us the p-value to tell us that the asterisk shows that the p is less than 0 0.05. But I would not be able to tell if for the weight gain, did they actually use a chi-square because of the proportion or did they use a t-test because the values for this study are actually continuous variable. For the B, I can say for sure, because the B is a, is, it's a continuous variable, for the C is a continuous variable. And if you look at this, if you look at the D, the mesenteric fat index is in proportion. So I won't, I won't be able to tell now if it is chi-square or if it is t-test you know, because we only have the p-value. We don't have the test of significant to, to tell us exactly what test of significant that would use. So we would leave the figure one and we will go over to the figure two. Now the figure two, the figure two uh, is a representative intestinal histomorphological features of the nigh tilapia. So the figure two looked at the histomorphological features of the tilapia fishes. We'll take I. I looks at the muscularis thickness, the muscularis thickness, which is measured in micrometers. So from these, you can actually tell that there is a statistically significant reduced muscularis thickness for the MFO category compared to the MF. And also for the HFO category compared to the HF. The same thing for the M, which looked at the MROA relative expression. There's a statistically significant lower MROA relative expression for the MFO compared to the MF. The same thing with the Vili height in J. There was a statistically significant reduction in the Vili height for the MFO category compared to the MF. You know, we also saw in N and we also saw a statistically significant reduction for the MFO for the Vili width, which is measured in micrometer. So the figures we've, we have seen here in figure two shows us that there is a histomorphological feature changes that is caused by the antibiotics mixed with the medium fat and also with the high fat. So we would go further to the figure, we'll move to the figure three that looked at the intestinal oxidative stress. Now, from, from these figures, you can see that there is a high 
there's a high or there's a statistically significantly higher oxidative stress that is observed in the category with the meat fat and the high fat with the antibiotics compared to the category without the antibiotics. So this figure is simply like you can see the red is statistically significantly higher compared to the, to the, to the blue in most of the figures, which is giving us a clue that the antibiotic causes intestinal oxidative stress, causes endoplasmic reticulum stress, and also the apoptotic responses, which is a form, which is a form of program cell death. So in figure three, we see all this. That is why the red seem to be shooting higher compared to the blue, telling us that the oxidative stress, the endoplasmic reticulum stress, and the program cell death is higher amongst the categories of the tilapia fishes that has or that were uh, given the antibiotic with the fat meal. Um, so we'll go further below. We'll go further below. As we can see in the figure, in the figure four, in the figure four, it talks about the microbiota, this valve C, which is uh, responsible for looking at the microbacteria, especially the imbalance of the microbacteria or the microorganisms. So from these figures, we can see that the antibiotics has an effect on the microorganisms. Like you can see, for the back in the B, in the B here, for the bacterial, the bacterial detis, absolute abundance, you would see or you would observe that there is a statistical significant increase in the count in the MFO compared to the MF. And the asterisk here tells us there is a significant difference. So the MFO has a statistical significant higher count for these bacteria compared to the MF. Also for this one where you have the fuso bacteria absolute abundance, there was a statistical significant higher MF compared to MFO and higher HF compared to HFO. The D also gives us a clue for the reduction also in the bacteria in the MFO compared in the a reduction in the HFO compared to the HF. But when it comes to the MF is the opposite. The MF had a statistical significant reduction compared to the MFO in the treatments. Now, uh, if you look at this, you would see here, they did a form of an analysis of the principal, uh, they, they did a principal component analysis. And if we, if I go further to search for the principal component analysis, there's something they said here, the researchers said to determine the influence, I'm here now, to determine the influence of fat content and oxytetracycline on bacteria phylotype distribution, a principal component analysis was performed on the antibiotics. The bacteria communities from the dietary treatments were divided into two clear groups. In a nutshell, what they are trying to tell us that the principal component analysis is showing is that there was an increase in the bacteria community of 87.10%. There was an increase in the bacteria community, 87.10% in the fat contents compared to, in the fat content alone, compared to the bacteria community when the fat content is mixed with the antibiotics. So 
they are trying to tell us the principal component analysis they ran showed us that when the fat content is mixed with the antibiotic, there is a reduction in the total variation, which is 9.70% compared to when it's only the fat content, which is 87.10%. Now, this is very clear, but the part where I'm not comfortable is my understanding of principal component analysis is not what is mentioned here. I know principal component analysis as a form of analysis like if you're talking about factorial analysis where you have so many variables that at the end of the day, you want to sum all these variables to mean one thing. For example, now you have a questionnaire which you have designed. And in that questionnaire, you have 20 questions. You don't want to use the 20 questions individually for your results. You want at the end of the day, when your respondents have answered these 20 questions, you want to sum up these 20 questions and grade them so that those that have a score below a certain number might have hypertension and those that have a score above certain number don't have hypertension. So at the end of the day, you want to be able to assess that these 20 questions you are asking this respondent, they are all measuring prevalence of hypertension. So for me to be sure that these 20 questions I've asked that I want to sum up to answer hypertension are asking the same thing. So I'm going to do a principal component analysis that is going to give me a score which is between zero and one, because the principle of components, the, principle, the, 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 the methodology for principal component analysis, it uses the Pearson's correlational coefficient. So the values it will give you when you run it is between zero and one. So if I put my 20 questions in the principal component analysis platform, and I have a value of 0 0.7 or 0 0.8, which is strong. It tells me that question one have a strong correlation with question two. It has a strong correlation with question three up to question 20. Meaning that the 20 questions I'm asked, they are correlating with each other to answer the fact of prevalence of hypertension. But if I run my principal component analysis and I'm having a value of 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, it means that question one is not, there's a poor correlation between question one and question two, between question two and question three, between question three and question four. So the 20 questions I'm asking are not correlating with each other. They are not all answering hypertension. So what I would do as a researcher, I'm going to go back and look at the questions again to ensure they are answering the same thing. It's like factorial analysis. That is what I know principal component analysis is used for. But in the context in which the principal component analysis is used in this analysis, I don't know. I don't have an idea if it is used this way. The researchers may be correct, but I am saying that in my own field of study, which is public health, this is the way we use principal component analysis for. We use it to test if the cumulative questions we are, answering, we are asking a respondent to give us one variable, they are all tending to mean one thing. So that if they are not answer, if the questions are not going to give us one, if the individual questions that we're asking these respondents are not going to give an, 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 don't have the ability to sum up, to give us one variable, then we will go back to these questions and readjust them. All right? So I just felt I should uh, mention that, but in this field, uh, probably that's the way it is used. So uh, our time is running up. Uh, so I'm going to run down to uh, the next um, the next uh, figure, which is uh, the relative uh, ATA KEGG, which means the Kaito Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. So they actually looked at how the antibiotics will affect the genes, uh, how it will affect 
the various genes which are listed here. If you look at A, they've, they've, they, have, they have already listed them up here, the different genes that are measured. So if we look at the B, the B which uh, looked at the pathway composition, the MTB pathway com composition, if you go below, you would see the meaning the meaning of MTB, which is the metabolism pathway. So the B is looking at the metabolism pathway composition. So from our chart here, we can see that there is a statistical significant drop in the metabolic pathway for MFO compared to the MF without the antibiotic and it's statistically significant. So they looked at the different, the different pathways, the GIP pathway, which means the, gen, the genetic information processing. So this figure five looked at the different, uh, the different genes and how the antibiotics affects uh, them. In the figure, in the figure six, which is where they looked at the Pearson's correlational coefficient. All right, like I explained before here, they used colors instead of using the values. If you see here, red is one. Here, red is one. And over here, the lighter green is minus one. One is a strong correlation, meaning that as the dependent variable is increasing, the independent variable is also increasing. Why below here, which is minus one, is a strong correlation, which means as the dependent variable is increasing, the independent variable is decreasing. Now, zero is black. Zero means there is no correlation, there is no association between the dependent and the independent. Now, 0 0.5 could mean moderately strong moderately strong correlation. 0 point, uh, 0 0.5, yeah, moderately strong, you know. Um, so if you're moving from 0 0.5 to one, it means you're increasing in strength. If you're moving from minus 0 0.5 to minus one, it means you're increasing in strength, but in the negative. So if I come to this point now, what are the researchers trying to say? Up here, they looked at the different up here, they looked at the different microbiota. Up here is a different microbiota. Why here, they looked at the different measured uh, parameters of the fishes. For example, WG means weight gain. So if I'm going to use WG as an example in the interpretation of this correlation, WG against hair flea. WG against hay flea. If you look here, the box here is green. The box here is green, meaning that it may not be exactly minus one. It may not be exactly minus one because the green, it's a bit lighter. So it may not be, so it may be around minus 0 0.7, around minus 0 0.7 tending towards minus 0 0.5 because of the color. So because this is minus, what is it telling us? It depends on which is the dependent and it depends on which is the independent because right here, I can't really say uh, which is the dependent variable or which is the independent variable. But if I'm going to use the weight gain as the dependent variable and I'm going to use the whole flea as my independent variable, then in interpreting this, I'm going to say that as, my, as the weight gain of the tilapia fish is increasing, the whole flea is decreasing. The same thing with the same thing with the rhodobacter. As the weight gain is increasing, the rhodobacter, which is an intestinal microbiota, is also increasing. If you look at the aeromonas, the aeromonas is different. The aeromonas is red, meaning that it is one. 
one means strong and one is positive, meaning that as the dependent is increasing, the independent is also increasing. So if I'm going to use the weight gain in this area, which is the red, it means that as the weight gain of the tilapia fish is increasing, the aeromonas is also increasing. At this point, you will see it is black. Black is zero. Black is zero. So black zero means that there is no association between weight gain and the cytophalagy, the, the cytophagalus. So there is no correlation between the weight gain and the cytophagalus because it is black. And from this key we have here, black is zero. Zero means there's no correlation. There's no piercing correlation. Uh, and another thing I noticed is why the test of significance has been done, which is the piercing's correlational coefficient. They didn't tell us if the association is significant or not. Uh, because even if, even if, even if there is a positive association between weight gain and aeromonas showing red, as the weight gain is increasing, the aeromonas is also increasing, which is strong. We need to know if this correlation is statistically significant. Because the fact that something is correlating doesn't mean it is significant. So the p-value still gives us a clue whether we need to pay attention to the correlation or not. So even if the weight gain has a strong positive correlation with the aeromonas, if our p-value had shown an increase in 0 0.05, meaning there is no association, then no matter how strong the piercing correlation is, there is still no association between weight gain and aeromonas. So it is not enough to have your correlation, your piercing correlation coefficient. It is a proper practice to also have the p-value. That way we can say for sure if the, uh, if, the, if the correlation we have measured is statistically significant or not. Because the p-value in statistic is our evidence that whatever two variables you have compared is statistically significant. So the test of significance is good, but the p-value gives is the evidence that that two comparison you've done is statistically significant. So I think it is a big omission in our figure six, not to have a p-value for each of the correlation that was done. That is why for me, I would have preferred a table here. I would have preferred a table here that would have shown us our arrow, the exact arrow value, whether it's 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 or zero, then it would have shown us the arrow square, which would have given us a clue of the percentage of the weight gain that is correlating with the aeromonas. Then it would have given us the p-value so that we can either, uh, the p-value will, 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 will help us decide if we should pay attention to the association or not to pay attention to it. You know, this is a beautiful, uh, this is a beautiful uh, picture, uh, but without the p-value, it doesn't really tell us much because we can't really tell if we need to hold on to the association or not. Uh, table one is almost like a summary of the things we have said in the different figures. Like for example, the type of effect here is growth performance. Growth performance, the toxicological effect is the weight gain. So where you have the, the meat fat with the antibiotic, there was an increase, you know, there was an increase but where you have the high fat with the antibiotic, there was a decrease. So that is what this is showing us.
So the reference figure, we have already looked at the different figures. All right, so I think uh, that is basically it in terms of the statistics uh, for this. I think the goal, the goal of the researchers for this study, which you have seen from the title, is to show that when fishes are given high fat content diet, they should not be given antibiotics concurrently because the antibiotics has a way of causing a lot of adverse effects in their growth and also in the different aspects that concerns them, especially in their intestinal health. The parts that I'm not very comfortable with in terms of the statistics in summary is I am not sure whether the student t test is used or whether the chi-square is used because some of the figures have percentage and when you have percentage is a chi-square but when you have the raw continuous value is a t-test and in the case where this line is running across three variables definitely three variables now means is an ANOVA and we don't know if an ANOVA is used here and also for some of the figures a line is not shown so we don't know whether the comparison in this case is statistically significant or not all right so i, I think that is uh, that is basically it and in the next uh, observation uh, is the fact that the Pearson's correlation is not very uh, clear because even if we know even if we know that the independent is correlating with the dependent we don't have a p-value that will give us a clue if the Pearson's correlation is statistically significant or not. And finally, the way in which the principal component analysis is used for this study is not the way that it is used for my own kind of field. You know, where we use principal component analysis like a form of factor analysis, where we have so many variables and we want to merge those variables to tell us one thing. So we want to be able to tell that the 20 variables are answering one thing, you know? So it has, it generates a value between zero and one. 0 0.4 below means poor correlation between the 20 variables and 0 .0 0.5, 0 0.6 and above means there's a strong correlation between these 20 variables. Uh, my time is exhausted and I think I am going to end my class here. So I don't know if anyone uh, has a question uh, with, the, uh, with the statistical aspects of the analysis. Uh, um, thank you, Felix, for the okay. presentation. I think we have some questions in the chat. Uh, okay, in the, yeah, let me, let me look for it. Uh, some questions in the uh, where do I get that from? In the message button, right? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm trying to get it. Um, how do I assess? Okay. Ibrahim, I think two of the so questions they are from you. Can you just um, tell us the question? Okay, so please, if you can, I'm trying to assess where the message box is. I'm still not, not been able to locate it. Ibrahim, I've, um, I've unmuted you. So please, could you ask the question, Ibrahim? Yeah, the first question is, uh, how, uh, how can I show the, uh, uh, the P, uh, sorry, before I show the uh, significant difference using the P-value, how can I show it? Yeah, hey, how can I trace it to show it before using the p-value? Because you mentioned that it's uh, because the p-value is only showing us the um, the uh, the value of the significance, not really where the significance is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 most times, uh, what is done, like in this paper, most times, what what the researchers will do since the researcher have decided to use figure instead of tables 
and you can't have tables and have figures at the same time in most in most cases so since the researchers have decided to use figure for me what i would do is on top of this place where you have this line i would put a if it's t test i will put small t up here equal to the value of the t test since the asterisk is already telling me that there is a statistical significance between the comparison of mf and this you may not need to put the p-value, you may not need to put the p-value, but on top of this place, you can put a small t equal to the value. If you don't want to put the small t up here equal to the value, then you can mention it in the text. You can mention it in the result that the t-test between the association for MF and MFO in weight gain is equal to this. You know, that way we would be able to know if a t-test was used, if ANOVA was used, or if chi-square was used. Because like I mentioned here, you have percentages now. So I can't really tell if it's the percent, because as long as you're comparing difference in percentages, it's chi-square, it's not t-test anymore. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, you answered it. The second question is, if you go to figure three. Figure three, okay, yeah. figure three. In some of the bars, Figure three. Yeah. Yes, like, yeah. like figure three E. Figure There's three some, Yeah. For the HFO. Exactly. Yeah, there's some break in the bus, so I don't understand what does uh, what that mean. Okay. Mm. Yes. I think in this in this figure three, if you look down, if you look down. Eh? What, what they are measuring is intestinal oxidative stress. Okay? Oh. Now, for E, which is the ATFA, let's see what that means. The ATFA is looking at activating transcription factor. Eh? So the oh. activating transcription factor, that's an mRNA. So you're dealing with genes. So it's oh. possible during the, the transcription process, there were some, there were, in the, you, know, you know, this thing runs very fast. There are, in, in some cases, they didn't get a value. That is what I am, I am feeling. Oh. I don't want to assume that it is, it is an error in the, in the bar graph, all right? I'm assuming that they didn't get, you know, the value runs, the value runs from 0 0.5 to 4.5. Uh, and each of these, each of these bar graph is a, it's a value. Even if it's a one bar, each of them, there is a, there is a line, there is a value. So okay. I'm having a feeling that when it got to 1.5 heading to almost two, there was no value for the HFO. Okay. There was a, there was a cut. It, there was like a missing value. So it now continued from 2.5 up. That is what I am feeling, yes. I don't want to assume that it's, a, it's an error in the bar graph because this is, M, I, this is, a, this is a gene, it's a genomic analysis. It's usually very fast, yes. And, and Ibrahim, sometimes... yeah. Ibrahim the yeah. author of the, the author, one of the authors of the article is on the um, journal club, Samuel. So you can also throw that question at him. Okay. okay. On the I will WhatsApp, do that. On the WhatsApp group. Yes. Okay, Great. I will do that. I will do that. You yeah. will be able to answer that better. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'll do that. I'll do that. Thank um, you. Thank you very much, Mr. Felix. I think okay. I like the the way colors were used to for the correlation. Yes. This is the first time I will see that. I, mean, it, I like it. It's very nice. Yes. I think I'll try that yes. for one of my um, work also. Yes, it's, this particular one. It's, it's very nice, but interpreting it would, be, would not be easy for you, okay. you know? Yeah, it, it, it will not be easy for you, you know, because the way the correlation value is, it runs between 0, 0.0 to 0, 0.1. Eh? And yes. those values could mean weak, uh, st uh, strongly weak, weak, moderately weak, you know, moderately strong. No, like that. So, yeah, so, so you will not be able to use these terms accurately if you're going to use yeah. 
you know, yeah. and, and also the column will also not give you the opportunity to tell us what the p-value is. So for me, if you ask me, even if I have these colors, which is very unique, I, I truly have not seen this sort of thing before, it will also be proper to have the table. So that if we really want to know the true value of the correlation, we will go back to the table. You know, and also in correlation, the arrow square is also very important. Yes, the arrow yes, square, the yes, yes. yes the, the arrow square gives you an idea of the percentage of the independent that is correlating with the dependence. Mm. You know, so these are very, very key values that 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 makes your Pearson's correlation sweeter to interpret in terms of your writing. You can have the author address some of these comments. At least it yeah, yeah. more like yes yes okay thank you very much i think we'll close right away and then we can continue the discussion continue on the whatsapp yeah on the whatsapp yes yeah. so i would be on whatsapp to answer for that questions yes all right thank you very much so all bye. right okay bye-bye thank you everyone